afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Sophia Azab, and I am an assistant professor of Black Studies in the Department of English and affiliate faculty with the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago. Before we begin this discussion today uh, with our guests, who I will introduce shortly, I would like to thank the CSRPC and Interim Director C. Riley Snorton, Marilyn D. Willis, Tracy Matthews, and Jacqueline Gaines for supporting and facilitating this speaker series alongside the More Than Diversity Campaign's Departmentalization Committee, of which I am also a member. The Departmentalization Committee came together in the summer of 2020 to explore the possibility of funding a new department devoted to the study of race at the University of Chicago in the wake of faculty, student, and staff mobilization with the More Than Diversity campaign and within a global landscape of insurgency and protest against anti-Black state violence and white vigilantism. In this speaker series, we are soliciting advice from our colleagues with long experience in fields attuned to the study of race in regards to the institutional commitments necessary to establish a department devoted to the study of race at this institution. This session will center questions and perspectives that arise in part from the field of critical university studies, although it is certainly not limited to that, which at its best attends to the dynamics of race, gender, coloniality, and power, the casualization of academic labor, including that of students, and financing and disinvestments in the landscape of higher education without romanticizing certain academic uh, ideals. And uh, just for proper citation, I've borrowed and massaged that description of the field from the writings of Eli Mayerhoff and Zach Schwartz Weinstein. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our guests today, uh, Dr. Roderick A. Ferguson and Dr. Nick Mitchell. Roderick A. Ferguson is the William Robertson Co. Professor and Chair of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Yale University. He received his BA from Howard University and his PhD from the University of California, San Diego. An interdisciplinary scholar, his work traverses such fields as American studies, gender studies, queer studies, cultural studies, African-American studies, sociology, literature, and education truly interdisciplinary. He is the author of One Dimensional Queer, Polity 2019, We Demand the University and Student Protests, published by the University of California Press in 2017, The Reorder of Things, The University and Its Pedagogies of Minority Difference, University of Minnesota Press 2012, and Aberrations in Black Toward a Queer of Color Critique from the University of Minnesota Press in 2004. He is the co-editor with Grace Hong of the anthology Strange Affinities, the Gender and Sexual Politics of Comparative Racializations from Duke University Press 2011. He is also co-editor with Erica Edwards and Jeffrey Ogbar of Keywords of African American Studies, NYU 2018, in which Nick Mitchell also has a fabulous essay on uh, diversity. He is currently working on two monographs in view of the tradition, art and black radicalism and the bookshop of black queer diaspora. Oh, sorry, art and black radicalism as the subtitle of in view of the tradition and the second project, the bookshop of black queer diaspora. Ferguson is also the 2020 recipient of the Kessler Award from the Center for LGBTQ Studies. Ferguson's teaching interests include the politics of culture, women of color feminism, the study of race, critical university studies, queer social movements, and social theory. Nick Mitchell is associate professor in the Department of Feminist Studies and core faculty in the program in critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. As a researcher, Mitchell is principally engaged with the status of higher education in the US as a problem for historical and theoretical inquiry. As a writer, Mitchell aims to make better sense of university life worlds by developing scales, vocabularies, and categories to reframe and rethink its rhythms and textures. These research and writing efforts converge in recent essays published in Feminist Studies, Critical Ethnic Studies, The New Inquiry, and Spectre, as well as in two forthcoming books, 
two forthcoming books, my goodness, Discipline and Surplus, Black Studies, Women's Studies, and the Dawn of Neoliberalism under contract with Duke University Press, and The Theory of the University in Theory, Essays on Institutionalized Knowledge. And I was sitting with your Spectre essay earlier today, just rereading, um, and it just gives me so much pleasure to have you both here. Uh, and I thank you for joining us all this afternoon. So the first question I would like to ask is quite a broad one, um, but I hope to invite uh, you both to ruminate on this in any direction you wish. Uh, and I would like to ask if each of you might describe your formative encounters with the study of race, and perhaps you might wanna explore that in conversation with your formative encounters in critical university studies uh, in which you both uh, have written prolifically. Um, so perhaps we'll start uh, with Dr. Mitchell, if that is uh, amenable to you both, and then continue with Dr. Ferguson. Sure, and um, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's uh, great to be here and be in conversation with you all. Um, so it's interesting, uh, like I have an undergraduate degree in women's and gender studies. Uh, I have a PhD in history of consciousness, but no one knows what that is, um, and an emphasis in feminist studies, but none of my uh, official uh, affiliations have been in um, degree granting programs that are um, explicitly devoted to the study of race, although I think that it's been an overwhelming trajectory through throughout my work. Um, and one of the reasons why I've be, I became invested in um, looking at the university as a context for um, framing the study of race is, well, the fact that I went to graduate school in the middle of the 2008 recession, um, in which uh, the funding for doing that study was pretty quickly um, disappearing at the same moment at the, at the, at the institution I was in, um, we were more or less hemorrhaging faculty who were engaged um, with that study. And so uh, at the, the historical moment when it seemed most disposable uh, to, to the university and uh, least renewable, um, it became pretty necessary to investigate the institutional conditions as well as the, the political and economic um, convergences uh, that led to those institutional conditions and develop a vocabulary um, with it. And it, it was, uh, I guess, somewhat fitting the fact that I went to graduate school um, as the initial efforts to institutionalize ethnic studies were um, reaching their 40th and um, nearing their 50th uh, year. And it started engaging in a, in a project that was about um, thinking historically about Black studies um, through different and sometimes competing frames um, in that context. Um, so I started investigating Black studies at the moment when the university was really changing. And it became my entry point into thinking about the university itself. Um, and I think that, that that's really useful because the, the, the history of Black studies, of course, um, occurs in a, a moment of major tra transition um, in the um, form and function uh, of the university. In 1960, there are about 3.5 million people enrolled in universities. In 1970, there are about 8, uh, 8 million. So the entire institutional capacity is more than doubling um, in the course um, of a decade, and the demographic um, organization of the institution is radically uh, shifting. And with student demand for Black studies, uh, what, what's being asked for is a, is a, a differently organized um, form of university. And I think that that's really important to keep in mind when we're, when we're talking about um, new efforts to institutionalize the study of race, is that oftentimes the form of the demand is it's it's a way of organizing what you can ask for when what is desired can't always be 
um, expressed in a form that the in, that, that it's imagined that the institution can deliver on. Um, and so the institutional form carries um, so much surplus desire um, that it's um, it's cathected um, in, in, in a certain kind of way, and it's it's attachment forming in a certain kind of way. And I think if you follow Robin Wiesgen's thinking on how we relate to these enterprises, it's al almost always capable of disappointing. Uh, it almost promises disappointment in some ways. And so I think that the, the mismatch of what we imagine practically and what's invested in 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 the practicality of this imagination and that's the way that it, it overruns is always um important and uh an important context to um reflect on but in, in terms of thinking about the, the, the history of black studies the thing that i had to deal with most intensely was the fact that the first in institutionalizing efforts for Black studies within the, the first decade of their existence, um, almost all hold um, in one shape, way, in one way, shape, or form. Um, in 1970, there were about 500 active Black studies formation. Um, by the end of the decade, that dwindled to about 200. Um, and so the, the understanding that Black studies was not built to last. Um, ethnic study was, was not built to last, and it wasn't built to last partly because of the, the very crisis that, that brought it into, build, in, into being, which um, both demanded that universities respond, but also uh, led to a conservative university response that was almost entirely invested in soft money, um, which made the institutional life of black studies immediately unsustainable, even as it was it was achieved. And so just understanding that creating university infrastructure in response to demands is not creating university infrastructure over time. Um, and how to balance the 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 differing investments of different stakeholders is a, a constant uh, theme and and uh, question for consideration um, in my work. And so like that, that's kind of just a big overview of some of the questions that enliven me. But I, I think the, the one thing to kind of uh, use as a takeaway for this is just understanding that when we're talking about institutionalizing the study of race, we're we're talking about the function of the university in some really fundamental ways. And if we don't attend to the intersection of those, I think we're, we're potentially missing um, a big part of what's at stake. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Um, Rod, I mean, there's already so much there, but Rod, I would love uh, if you would like to respond to the same question. Sure. Um, first, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be uh, in this company. Um, you know, for me, the my first encounters with the study of race really began at Howard um, when I was an undergrad. And I, um, my first year at Howard was 1990. And, um, you know, it was the moment of, you know, the sort of national discussion around Afrocentrism. And so that's partly what I was entering uh, at that moment. And, you know, there were large debates on Howard's campus around, you know, the nature and direction of Afrocentrism. Some people agreeing, some people disagreeing, but at the foundation was an engagement, whether you agreed or not, with Black intellectual history and Black intellectual culture production, you know, that took place in all of the courses and um, or most of the courses, I would say, you know, you know, so for instance, my honors philosophy course that I took my second year began with um, um, Plato, but it ended with um, bell hooks, you know, and, you know, and I remember there was a speaker series that the then Vice President Joyce Ladner of Tomorrow's Tomorrow, the Black Woman, 
and the anthology of the death of white sociology but even before that you know she and her sister the ladner sisters the famous civil rights activists uh, from mississippi uh, ladner put together a, a speaker series of black intellectuals and so that was my maybe sophomore junior year and some of the people that came through um, were like margaret walker alexander before she died you know um, the poem for my people, the novel Jubilee, um, Malifia Sante, uh, one of the founders of Afrocentrism, um, Tony K. Bambara, before she died. Um, who else? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Ngugi Watiango, you know, as well. And so the study of race, you know, as the study of um, Black social formations was all around me at Howard. When I went to UC San Diego, the study of race became, in a sense, bigger because it was about, um, you know, multiracial uh, formations having to do with uh, Chicanos, with Asian Americans, with African Americans. Um, and that was very much uh, what the ethnic studies department at the University of California, San Diego um, was about, um, led by Ramon Gutierrez, uh, George Lipsitz and Yenis Spiritu. In the lit department, there was a kind of um, um, convergence of women of color feminism, post-colonial studies, Marxism through folks like Lisa Lowe, um, uh, Lisa Yoniyama, um, Rosemary George, um, in the history department, uh, Takashi Fujitani, working with, you know, a kind of, um, you know, new Asian studies or new Asian history as well. And so that was also, that helped me to broaden my sense of the study of race and also to put uh, Black social formations and Black diasporic formations in conversation with these new formations that I was learning about at the time. And you know, also around that time, um, my then graduate student peers uh, formed a writing group uh, of folks in ethnic studies. I was in sociology. Uh, people in literature, some folks who were dissertating um, in the area from NYU, um, Victor Viesca, who um, now teaches at one of the Cal States, who was writing a dissertation under the direction of Trisha Rose um, about uh, Chicano hip hop and post-industrialization in California. Uh, other folks who were in that group, uh, Ruby Tapia, um, who's now at uh, the University of Michigan, Grace Hong um, at UCLA, Chandan Reddy was dissertating from Columbia, Guy Gopanath was a um, postdoc work from Columbia working with Lisa Lowe, uh, Danny Widener, who was now at UC San Diego, but was at uh, NYU working on the Black arts movement in California. And all of us had a sense that we were intervening into the various ethnic studies with a kind of uh, dialogical sensibility around race in mind. So if my interventions were to be in, in Black studies, it was to bring a kind of dialogical um, spirit sensibility agenda, you know, to that field. Um, and the same thing for, you know, say Grace intervening into um, Asian American studies or uh, Ruby's interventions into Chicano studies, what have you. And so, you know, out of that, my work around queer color critique, you know, came. Um, it was with the work that I was doing with an organization that I co-founded with my junior faculty colleagues at the time at the University of Minnesota. That organization was called the Faculty of Color Initiative. 
And our agenda was to bring and retain <laughs> faculty of color across the liberal arts. But we had a sense that we did not simply want, um, you know, faculty of color who, you know, did not have critical agendas, you know, who were not trying to intervene critically in their various fields. And so what we said to the administration, when we went to the administration, was that, you know, one, the University of Minnesota has a problem with diversity, it doesn't have it, much of it. Um, we have a plan um, for how to attract junior scholars of color here. And the plan was to, one, have like a, um, a major speaker series, uh, national speaker series that would mark the University of Minnesota as a place that was interested in the intersections of race, political economy, feminism, queer studies, um, cultural studies. Um, and that, you know, I can get into this later. We have, you know, we had a whole plan for how to recruit and retain um, folks who were doing really critical, innovative work in fields like history, anthropology, theater and dance, cultural studies, literature, English, um, what have you. And it worked. The issue that we were confronted with was that uh, we were doing the work as junior faculty of color to produce the conditions whereby we would stay in the university. Right. And so we were taking on these extra burdens of the university and had to deal with, you know, things like, um, you know, chairs of departments calling us up, thinking that we were auxiliaries of the administration, asking if we had scheduled lunches for this candidate, for that candidate, um, blah, blah, blah. But also there was a greater um, problem, I thought, in that uh, we became so fixated on the uh, money that was given to us initially, that we began to lose sight of the critical purposes for the group, you know? That we were, we began with the vision that we would be there to attend each other's courses, read each other's work, help develop each other as intellectuals. And once we were given this funding, well, it was a lot, you know, we realized that we became so focused on the budget that we lost sense of that original vision. And so we decided to give the remaining money back. And that was an interesting maneuver because it immediately opened up a whole host of possibilities for the group. So that, um, you know, it, the group immediately became available um, to folks outside the University of Minnesota once it wasn't so caught up in, you know, the imprimatur of the University of Minnesota. So we decided to informalize the group and pull away from the administration. Uh, we still did certain things like um, meet with candidates, but we didn't accept any more money from the group, uh, from the administration, and um, sort of announced ourselves as um, a, an organization and a group that was available not simply for folks at the University of Minnesota, but for people in the surrounding colleges and universities, and also for the Walker Art Center. So our numbers grew once we decided to informalize and um, in many ways, my second book, The Reorder of Things, came out of that, you know, what happens when a critical agenda, you know, becomes so captivated by um, administrative accoutrements and rewards. So maybe I'll leave it there. Thank you both. Um, I mean, I think what you've really highlighted for us here are the sort of to translate it through my own or to lay it out through my own work like the levels of mistranslation or misrecognition in this constellation of faculty students staff and administrative uh goals and visions uh and and the sort of way in which uh you both experienced that sense of packaging uh uh 
packaging within the ask or the demand, right? Uh, something that is only legible or, or uh, in, imaginable in a certain way to the administration. Um, or the administration is capital T, capital A. I am just like, it's it's now its own category. Um, so I really appreciate both of your, your insights um, and the way that you uh, parlayed them through your own uh, formative experiences, right? With the study of race and also critical university studies is really illuminating. Um, to, I think, develop on that just a bit, um, I wonder, and especially for you, Rod, you focused uh, many of your opening remarks on your experience at Minnesota, um, which is really interesting. Of course, this is like where you had an experience, particular set of experiences as a junior scholar as well, um, but you're also both positioned in particular spaces now. And I wondered, um, and you can take this question anywhere you would like to, to take it, if uh, either or both of you might, um, perhaps articulate your current institutional homes and departments intellectual missions as they uh, imagine it to be. And if you wish, uh, maybe push a little bit further and articulate what your intellectual missions within those departments might be. I know they don't always align perfectly. Um, so perhaps Nick, I don't know if, your experience um, in the Department of uh, Critical Race and Ethnic Studies, as well as uh, Feminist Studies, uh, has has any relation to that. But I'd be curious to hear about those intellectual missions and how you square with them. Yeah. So, um, so I was hired at UC Santa Cruz, um, which is also where I went to, where I went to graduate school weird, um, in 2015. Um, and I was the first person hired in the critical race and ethnic studies program. Um, and so critical race and ethnic studies right now is still a program, but we are in the process and are expecting by July 1st to be a department. Um, this was not, not the necessarily the guaranteed trajectory. Um, but, you know, when I started in 2015, uh, the program was one year old. The major was one year old. We had seven majors. Um, now we have 100 something, around 100, 150. In, so in the span of you know, six years. Um, so the, the, the growth has been um, pretty considerable. And just to place that in context, in the humanities at UC Santa Cruz, um, majors pretty much across the board um, are declining. Um, and so in, in CRESS, Critical Race and Ethnic Studies, our majors, our majors growth has been really a distinct trend. Um, and it's been met with a lot of different, both enthusiasm and like a certain degree of skepticism, um, for sure. So, I mean, I think one thing to say is that I am not necessarily of, I'm not necessarily a hardliner that an institutional project needs to be driven by a very formalized intellectual mission. Um, I, I think that in some ways, people who can work together and people who believe that working together well um, and supporting each other um, carefully in order to grow within general parameters is enough intellectual like intellectual project <laughs> to make something grow. And I think that's really important because the, the, the idea that uh, legitimate projects have this kind of core, very formalized, almost like, it's almost like, you know, uh, 
like a, a Ricardo's comparative advantage theory of of um, of intellectual formation that it has to be distinguished against what other people are doing in order to kind of like provide its distinction. Um, that, that that sort of value theory uh, oftentimes means that the very practices that you need to generate in order to have something live in practice <laughs> within the university um, don't necessarily get get prioritized. And so um, the way that I've oftentimes expressed the way that we work is that there, there's a, a imagination of collective coherence that this intellectual project theory of um, of program building um, relies on, and that everything has to be everything becomes coherent based on having this kind of core intellectual mission. Um, that doesn't really map on the history of ethnic studies, um, and I think that ours is a coalitional. Um, it's, it, it's a coalitional theory of ethnic studies with certain priorities in common, um, and I think more than anything, people who are committed to work with each other and to continue showing up because they believe in the project and they support each other's work, even though we don't do the same thing. Um, and so I think that that, that is kind of the, the practical theory of the way that we, we, we come, come together. I will say that like um, the idea that I had in, in coming in was that I wanted to build an ethnic studies formation that the critical engagement with racial capitalism was at the center. Um, and that, that was the, the basic building block for thinking about how we organize the curriculum, um, what, what we prioritize in the introduction class, um, how the, the, the relationship between the big undergraduate intro class and the, uh, the upper division toolkit classes got articulated and then how the scene, like where people ended up in the senior capstone class um, in, in traveling through the curriculum. So, I, but I thought that that was a pretty broad consensus point um, that, that didn't really require a, a very, very refined um, understanding of what that meant. And also didn't, didn't require that everyone agree that much on um, what it meant to like have racial capitalism as a, as a building block. So I think that that's kind of how the, the practical part of institutionalization has unfolded for us. And I would say, like all, like all said, um, we started out with formation with one faculty member. Uh, we, we hired a second in the second year. We have now four core faculty members in, in CREST and over 100 majors. Um, and so the, the growth of the major has outpaced our ability to actually serve the students who are interested in it. And I think that that's testament to the, the, the idea of there's something here that um, if it can grow in certain ways, actually um, there's more interest than necessarily folks might imagine in advance. I can certainly relate to that at the University of Chicago. Um, I love the point you made about the layering commitments, um, cons you know, that sort of constitutive ties within the department, not necessarily relying on total consensus. Um, and I wonder if you found a similar, uh, over the course of your many affiliations, Rod, um, if you've encountered similar kinds of uh, either cohesive moments for coherence uh, or perhaps contention across those sorts of layering commitments in what we imagine as the intellectual mission of these uh, programs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not sure how much detail to go into with that. Um, it's funny when, when Nick was talking, I realized, oh, I did this version of, um, you know, I did the UC Santa Cruz version of this 
when they were talking about building Chris years ago. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I mean, you know, I okay, let's just start off with uh, the question that you asked in terms of um, where I am now, the vision of the faculty. I benefited from the work that uh, several folks did, but I uh, should know Interpol Grewal did um, at Yale in WGSS, Women's Gender Sexuality Studies, and that you really work to try and transnationalize uh, uh, that department, that program. And she did. So, uh, you know, we hired folks who do work on the Middle East and North Africa, a um, person who does work on uh, Turkey. Uh, and we're in the process of hiring, you know, other people who represent a kind of transnational uh, and also, um, you know, women of color feminists, Black feminists uh, take on women's and gender studies. Uh, in terms of my own vision, you know, uh, I have tried to shape that vision in terms of my conversations with colleagues, of course, but also in conversation with the undergraduates, you know? Um, and for me, that is one of the major lessons of the student movements and social movements of the 60s and 70s, you know, that, um, you know, you try and build a uh, critical, and um, you know, sort of progressive curriculum based on the conversations with uh, students. And so at Yale, the conversations, what I've been hearing in terms of the needs of students, they need to be, you know, um, more consistent courses in things like Black feminist theory. They need to be more consistent courses in uh, queer and trans work. There need to be more consistent courses or uh, in disability studies, right? And so those are the things that I'm using to, as well as indigenous studies, uh, that I'm using to, I mean, I could go on and on in terms of like uh, what students need. Um, and it seems to me that in trying to satisfy those needs, um, we actually produce departments and programs that are responsive to um, the questions that students are asking, young people are asking. You know, we're also trying to use the curriculum to help young people locate themselves within this world, right? and how to intervene in this world, right? Um, one of the things that we did when I was at Minnesota was that we, you know, we changed the curriculum after 911 because so many young people were asking the question of, you know, what does this mean? Why did they do this to us, blah, blah, blah. And so we, um, you know, produced, our version of post-nationalist American studies, you know, so that it would be a way to educate young people about the history of U.S. empire and all the places that the U.S. has gone, right? Um, and all the lives that it has affected in its military power, in its economic power, in its foreign policy power. And it seems to me that, um, those are the kinds of things that a healthy department wants to do, right? It wants to help its young people figure out, you know, um, this world, you know, and their place within it. Thank you. I so appreciate that, um, Rod. And and something you sort of bring to mind is, is kind of a, a latent, I think, assumption that um, I've heard before um, 
where you know fields such as Black studies, Latinx studies, uh, even Asian American studies and Indigenous studies are thought not to be inherently uh, transnational at their base, right? So there, there's always, the, especially Black studies, I will say, it's always right imagined to be centered in the US and that every framework is somehow uh, indebted or emerges from the US. Um, or, and it, I guess this would be the in, inverse, I don't really know how to use those terms, um, accompanying that, would be the assumption that then uh, US based black intellectual, cultural, political life has nothing that speaks to the broader uh, uh, globe, global uh, world and, and, and societies um, beyond it. And um, it, you know, it really brings to mind the hearing about both of the curricular kind of responses and pedagogical focuses that you've, you've both pursued in your respective um, you know, affiliations past and present. Um, you know, it really, and this is a question we're reckoning with, and it sounds like you are as well, Nick, in your department, it really brings to mind, you know, what are the challenges, particular challenges um, of starting a department, right, of founding a new department that is dedicated to the study of race now versus at other moments of the recent past. And, Nick, you've gestured to the history of Black studies, uh, adjacently third world studies and ethnic studies, uh, foundings also in the 60s and 70s. Rod, you gave this beautiful snapshot um, of your experience at Minnesota and how, and you know, that, that post-national school of American studies was hugely influential in my own graduate training. Um, so it's now, it's like almost unnatural to think that that was never, right, a focus of the field. Um, so I, I wonder if um, either or both of you would like to reflect on what you see as, as the primary challenges of starting a new department at this moment in time. Um, and I will let you two decide between you who would like to speak first, so I don't single anyone out. <laughs> okay, so I got, I got a lot to say because we're, 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 we're in departmentalization um, hell um, right now. And like, I don't know if it's a transferable hell. I think, like, like I think some of the, the reasons why it's difficult just has to do with um, the the particularities um, of UC Santa Cruz. Um, but let let me just start here with the um, the advantages, the relative advantages of departmentalization. Now, um, well, one is that we have PhD programs in ethnic studies and black studies that are producing people who work in these fields. And that was not the case in 1968. Um, and so there are scholars who are ready to go, who are trained in the methodologies, who um, have done undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees in, in this field and have been trained in, in interdisciplinary studies. And so like, not only, not only if you are, are, are starting a department, do you have the possibility of being able to uh, draw on like a lot of talented people who are coming through a lot of, a lot of really good, long established decades old programs <laughs> um, to, to choose from. Um, but I, I, th I think also you just, um, you, you can think about different ways of, of forming expertise and organizing questions rather than um, going a different way, like the, the, the way, the different route in which you hire people who imagine their work on race or are just at, as a function of their institutional position. Um, encouraged to imagine their fealty to their department first <laughs> and then their their relationship to uh the institutionalized study of race second um it almost guarantees a a, a certain kind of um secondariness um a, a certain kind of a second class status to the, st the study of race that i think can be um one way of building at the edges um, but I think that 
if you're departmentalizing, you have a real, real advantage if you're, you're thinking about the pool of people that you want to draw on um, pretty dynamically. And that doesn't just have to come from people who are trained, who have a PhD, let's say, um, in ethnic studies from Berkeley, but, but people who come through institutional formations uh, that put them in close proximity to interdisciplinary modes of study and engagement that um, I think are really useful um, for the framework that uh, uh, new formations can draw from. Um, and so, like, I, I, you know, programs like lit literature in San Diego, I think both as an interdisciplinary cultural studies fo focused literature program that has long standing dynamic relationships with eth ethnic studies and has an extensive kind of um, critical gender studies and ethnic studies uh, like faculty uh, means that you, you kind of get the collateral benefits of uh, some of the more long long standing formations. And so I, I think that just in, in terms of strategy, there's that fact period um, that, that fa faces um, departmentalization. Um, with what Rod was mentioning earlier about the potential divergences in interests um, and the different forces that you're speaking to, uh, like Students want some things. <laughs> um, faculty don't necessarily want the same thing. Um, and how do you balance that in terms of, of, of building? I think it's a great opportunity to, to actually be challenged by um, that problem rather than just kind of, of breezing past it. Um, bringing students into the process. Uh, bringing students into the process in a, in a dynamic way where they are doing independent studies, they have a class, they are uh, reading the files of candidates who are applying for, for a job. I think actually building different, um, different forms of engagement with students uh, has been part, a really useful part of the history of ethnic studies, and I think it's for us in, in at Santa Cruz, it's been so important to have students involved at every phase of the process, even at the risk of looking weird to the administration, even at the, at the risk of looking le less professional, because we, it ends up being really exciting to have student buy-in. Once those people come, they already have students who support them in, in their classes. Um, and so I, I think just understanding that um, one, Building ethnic studies departmentally means that you can do something different. And I think that like actually prioritizing, changing the protocols of how things are done means that actually other departments can take notice <laughs> that there are different ways of doing things. So um, I again, like so when we're talking about building ethnic studies, we're also talking about different protocols of practicing what it means to be in a university. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, Rod, same question. <laughs> so, you know, um, there are certain on the ground realities that, you know, we have to bear in mind, I think, around this question. Most of the diversity that takes place within a university happens in the interdisciplinary units in terms of faculty hires, okay? Um, and oftentimes in terms of um, majors, right? There was a moment in which the UCLA Center for the Study of Women and the NYU counterpart, and I'm blanking on the name right now, uh, had a joint conference um, that I attended or symposium that I attended at UCLA and the then director of the UCLA Center, uh, uh, Kathleen McHugh had a PowerPoint up and it was where all of the um, women faculty, the BIPOC faculty were at UCLA and what would happen? Well, they were all in you know, the interdisciplinary units and then what would happen if those interdisciplinary units were gone? You wipe out 
the majority of minoritized faculty, you know, easily. And that reproduces across, you know, other campuses. So there's a lot at stake actually in having um, interdisciplinary programs, interdisciplinary departments. All right, now here's the tricky part, right? How to keep the interdisciplinary units from mimicking the disciplines, you know? Like that's a harder part, right? Because it also means that um, you have to have some mechanisms for maintaining your uh, investments in the non-normativity of the interdisciplinary enterprise, you know? But what happens when all the seductions, you know, come at you to be like history, you know? To be like English, you know? Um, to signify the statuses that those disciplines signify, you know? Um, that becomes the moment in which you lose sight of um, the interdisciplinary purpose and prize, you know, and that has to do with the reorganization of knowledge accompanied by new types of peoples and communities in the department. You know, something you both raised for me or reminded me of is how, how uh, standard it was in a department of Black studies uh, some American studies departments, ethnic studies departments, to learn deeply the history of the formations of our fields, uh, gender and sexuality studies, right? It, it was an urgent uh, intellectual and pedagogical and curricular task. And uh, I wonder, right, uh, if uh, rather than mimicking, right, as Rod uh, indicates, rather than mimicking or, or wanting to formalize ourselves in the way that a history department might, um, you know, whether our, or not our colleagues in those departments might actually look towards our fields of study in order to sort of reconcile with, you know, how do we learn our, our histories, right? How do we learn where these intellectual uh, orientations and the questions that and dynamics that, that uh, animate our, our fields of inquiry come from? Um, and on that note, I, I think it's it's really only fair to, to ask a, a question uh, that came in from uh, one of our audience members, uh, Warren, uh, which I think is a wonderful question, and I would love for us to end with that, if, if that's okay. Uh, Warren asks, at U Chicago, a lot of the undergrad organizers analysis includes interrupting the hierarchical and individualistic styles of learning that are central in most classrooms right now as well as providing free slots to uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color neighbors to take courses at the Ethnic Studies Department, or hopefully what will become <laughs> the department. Um, the idea is that a department that more fundamentally incorporates student and community leadership, not just faculty and administrative leadership, would help redistribute the machinery of knowledge production and create more cooperative learning environments. Um, do either of you have experience trying to create more collective spaces in the day-to-day -day classroom environment? Um, or do you have thoughts on how a department could help collective and liberatory pedagogies thrive? Okay, so first of all, hi, Warren. War I, I know Warren from other, other, other matters, so hello. Um, and it's a great question. It's a really hard question. I, I really suggest um, one of the best, I think, analytic efforts in the history of, of, of thinking about the, the, the history of ethnic studies, um, besides the reorder of things, of course, um, is Mark Chang's The Cultural Capital of Asian, Asian American Studies. Um, I think anyone who's thinking about ethnic studies needs to read this book. Um, it's so important. Um, and the frame that it, it, it thinks about, the frame it, it, it's engaged with is the different and competing ways in which the kind of inaugural studies for, uh, inaugural struggles for ethnic studies thought about autonomy. Um, and 
this is one of the reasons why it's hard. Um, many people who are trained in academia, you, you, you get your, your degree from academic institutions. Anyone who's coming in with the credentials to be a professor has been thoroughly shaped by the understanding of autonomy that is perpetuated by, by, by academic institutions, and no one is free of it. Um, no one. This one, not free of it. Every, it's, everyone, everyone encounters it is one that means that defines autonomy as being separate from the judgment of non-academic communities and even non-academic academic communities who are outside of your discipline. Um, and so that creates some really difficult kinds of tension and it created historical kinds of tension because there were formations that wanted to imagine their autonomy as being free from the judgment of the university. <laughs> um, and thinking about bringing com community people in as stakeholders in the, in the operations of, of the, 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 the departments. Um, and so th these kind of competing in fundamentally, I think, uh, pretty unreconcilable understandings of, of autonomy really make for some tensions, especially when you're thinking about is ethnic studies going to be more burdened than sociology um, or be more burdened than English in uh, needing to be answerable to the communities. It means that the people that you would be bringing in to be faculty and be staff in, in the department are going to be subject to two divergent and competing understandings of autonomy that ultimately add up to a really intense labor demand on your faculty. Um, and so I don't like, I think the question's important. I think the question's really, really valid. And I think that in practice, the question is really hard to live in. And it's hard to live in in a way who, who the people who are subject to it, which are going to be disproportionately Black, Indigenous, and people of color, are going to now have all of these competing and divergent work demands that their disproportionately not black indigenous and people of color colleagues are going to be like going to not going to have to answer to. Um, and so I think that the, the idea is great. I think the practice is really, really difficult to, to shift. And if it's going to happen, it's going to need to be coupled with a very different set of university criteria of what constitutes success in, in, in that world. Okay, so I'll go um, really quickly because I know we're about to run out of time. Yes, Sophia? All right. So, um, Really important question, really difficult to do, do it. Um, you know, uh, for instance, it's an opportunity for us to go back to those histories of uh, the early, of the student movement and the early founding of the interdisciplinary fields, especially ethnic studies, because this was part of the vision and it was also part of the enactment. You know, in Minneapolis, for instance, there was a tradition after the student protests at the University of Minnesota to produce what were called communiversities, uh, uh, spaces of learning outside of the university, um, that uh, those were real. Um, when I was a grad student at UC San Diego, one of the brilliant librarians at the um, Malcolm X Library in Southeast San Diego, Mark Cherry, put together this year long speaker series, not speaker series, but film series around um, black filmmakers. And um, he had those of us from uh, UCSD present and lead discussions with community folks around that. So I led a discussion on um, the film, Black Nations, Queer Nations in Southeast San Diego. Okay, so like, those kinds of things are really, really important. Right now, I do a lot of work with uh, a nonprofit uh, that's housed on Yale's campus, but is uh, not, a f not formally affiliated with Yale, even though it bears a name. Anyway, it's called the Yale Prison Education Initiative. So I teach um, courses um, 
at uh, a prison an hour away from here, um, uh, men's prison uh, called McDougall Walker. And I've taught a Black feminist theory class there, a critical university studies class there, and teaching um, uh, racial capitalism and Black radical tradi traditions course there. Um, those are the types of things that I think um, departments of ethnic studies need to do. Um, and then we can figure out the latest stuff after that, after we've signed on. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Nick and Rod, for your generous uh, responses to Warren's wonderful question. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of, of this incredible knowledge and these provocations with us today. I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for attending what is sadly the last event in this uh, uh, speaker series as part of the More Than Diversity campaign uh, with the uh, strong support of the CSRPC. Um, I think Tracy Matthews is dropping some links in the chat. There's a survey that folks can take. Um, and we look forward to hopefully seeing the U Chicago folks that are in the audience um, continue to advocate with us for an autonomous department devoted to the study of race, TBD on the title apparently. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation in other spaces. Thank you, Rod and Nick so much. And thank you everyone for being here.